Late Sunday morning, I get out of my truck, and as I'm crossing the grassy parking area, I pull out my phone and post a Facebook status checking in from the Woodmont Rod and Gun Club. Almost immediately, I get a puzzled comment from a friend. A gun club? More like a hunting club. A former hunting club, if you want to get technical about it. Woodmont used to be a private retreat where the rich and famous would come to unwind by shooting turkeys and white-tailed deer. Six U.S. presidents visited over the years. There's a rocking chair in which they all sat with their names engraved on one arm. Garfield, Arthur, Harrison, Cleveland, Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt. Babe Ruth visited. There's a photograph of him autographing a baseball hanging in the game room of the clubhouse. It's the sort of place where Dick Cheney might have shot one of his friends in the face. It's the sort of place I would probably hate if I didn't have roots there. Woodmont is 3,000 acres of forest 10 miles south of Hancock in western Maryland in the foothills below a long Appalachian ridge called Sidling Hill. The clubhouse, built entirely from local stone and timber, stands on an overlook above a broad expanse of trees with a railroad track cutting across in the distance. When I was a child, this place was a second home to me. No one in my family was wealthy, let alone connected enough to have been a member at Woodmont, or the club, as my dad usually called it. But Dad and his father, who I called Pap, both worked there for many years as guides, organizing hunts, going out ahead, and driving the game back toward the members so the swells wouldn't have to break too much of a sweat to bag their trophies. And my mother's parents worked and lived for 20 years on the turkey farm, where they raised the turkeys that the members would kill for sport. My mother and father met because of Woodmont. My brother and I exist today because that place existed and our parents were part of it. We spent a lot of time there as kids, playing in the clubhouse, sitting alongside dad or pap in pickup trucks, bouncing up and down the miles of dirt roads that crisscross the property. I learned the private geography of the club. The names of places at Woodmont were better known to me than the names of streets in my own hometown. The turkey farm where my mother and her sisters and brothers had grown up. Camp Cleveland, where the members and their guides used to meet for lunches of venison and fried apples while out on all-day hunts. The lower lake, where we used to fish. The airport, which is an open field with a dirt landing strip that had already been out of use for years when I was a kid. First and foremost in my mind was the clubhouse, with its rugged brown stone exterior, and inside its polished dark hardwood floors, high ceilings, and hunting trophies adorning every wall. To me, the clubhouse was Woodmont. I sat in the president's chair. I signed my name in the same guest book that contains the signature of Franklin Roosevelt. My brother, my cousins, and I played hide-and-seek and, and ghostbusters in the same hallways and guest rooms where the members and their guests walked and slept. Not while they were there, of course. I saw my dad and pap treated with deference and respect by rich men because they had a knowledge and a skill those rich men needed. At the time, issues of class were the furthest thing from my mind. I wasn't conscious of how wealthy most of these people were. They seemed ordinary to me. They dressed like us. They talked like us. They treated us all the same. Now I can't help but wonder how they treated working class people in their lives away from the club, or how they made their money in the first place or more likely how their parents or grandparents made their money, since most of the members of the club when I was growing up had inherited their memberships. The caretaker of Woodmont when I was a kid was a man who had inherited his club membership. His name was Henry, also his father's and his grandfather's name. We called him Hank. Hank's grandfather had been president of a steel company in Ohio and was also once the president of the Woodmont Club. In the mid-80s, Hank took over as caretaker at Woodmont and moved into the clubhouse. 
He had his own private apartment where he lived most of the year. During the holidays, he'd go down to Florida to be with his family, and usually my dad would stay at the clubhouse to look after the place. When I was about nine, Hank informed me that he'd discussed it with my dad, and they'd agreed that he could be my honorary uncle. I had no problem with that. You can't have too many rich uncles, I figured. Hank was a good guy. Dad and Pap remodeled a room on the first floor, right off one of the back entrances, to be their bedroom when they were staying at the clubhouse. It was room number 14. When I was staying there, I slept in 14 with my dad. Upstairs, at the end of a long hallway, there was a big room with 10 beds where the guides could sleep when the members were at the club for a hunt. It was called the Cuckoo's Nest. That's where Pap slept, if he was there while I was taking his bed in 14. In 1995, the club sold out to the state of Maryland. That was the end of Woodmont as I knew it. Today, much of the property is open year-round to the public for hiking and such, but the clubhouse is open by appointment only or for special events. Dad and Pap packed up their stuff from 14, left, and never went back. There's a box of my dad's things from 14 sitting under my mom's old sewing table in the basement of the house where I grew up. It hasn't been touched since it was put there, other than a bottle of wild turkey, from which I foolishly drank quite a bit when I was 19, only to wake up the next morning on the floor of my bedroom, hog-tied next to a drying pool of my own puke. That's a whole different story. Once a year, there's an open house where the public can drive down to the clubhouse and take a look inside for a few hours. That's what I'm doing when I check in and get that baffled comment about going to a gun club. It was a gun club. The first time I ever shot a gun was there, a few hundred feet away from the clubhouse. It was a hunting club. The first and only time I ever shot a deer was there. When I was 14 years old, something I was proud of at the time, but now wish I hadn't done. The first fish I ever caught was a sunny out of the lower lake. I walk up those front steps Sunday morning and it's an odd feeling. Nostalgia, yes, but also I'm thinking how I hardly ever walked up these steps when I was a kid. We always used to use one of the rear entrances, the one right by 14, or the one that leads into the kitchen. I thought of the front entrance as the back entrance, because that's how I arranged the place in my mind. Even though now I walk inside and know that makes no sense. You step through the front doors, and there's the great room to the right, furnished with the same couches and heavy wooden tables I remember. To the left is an ordinary looking door that looks like a closet, which I know is actually an elevator. Or it used to be, anyway. I don't know if it still is. One of the previous caretakers was eventually confined to a wheelchair and had an elevator installed in the clubhouse so he could go upstairs. It was small, the size of a coat closet, and you had to hold the button in the whole time to get it to move. And past the elevator on the left is the dining room with its long tables and its great stone fireplace flanked on either side by two full-body mounted white-tailed deer. Off the dining room is the kitchen, which looks completely different now than when I remember it. They've remodeled it, updated it, which it needed. There used to be a long Formica table in there where we'd eat breakfast, my pap, dad, brother, and I. I walk out of the dining room and across to the great room. In the corner to the left is a big screen TV. I smile because that's where the TV always used to be when I was a kid, too. There was a couch and a few chairs arranged around it, and we'd spend hours there watching a very ordinary-sized television because it was hooked up to a satellite dish, and at the time, we didn't even have cable at our house. I remember once sitting there watching a feed that was just playing commercial after commercial for Batman Mask of the Phantasm. I remember another time when Dad and I were pulling into the gravel lot behind the clubhouse, and Hank was on his way out for something. Before he went to his truck, he walked over, cupped his hands in front of his mouth, and said to me in a stage whisper, 
Star Trek The Search for Spock is on tonight at 8. Needless to say, Hank, Dad, and I were sitting in front of the TV watching Star Trek 3 that night. I remember Kirk taking out a Klingon with his phaser and Hank saying, nice shot. I walk into the library where the president's chair is. Somewhere there's a photograph of my dad sitting in that chair. I think there's one of me sitting in it too. Up on the wall is a print of a poem someone wrote about Woodmont. When I was a kid, it hung at the landing halfway up the stairs to the second floor. I used to love this poem. I had it memorized at one point. A poem about Woodmont, printed and framed. It told me how special this place was, how important it was to important people. Now I look at that poem and it reads like a chronicle of the adventures of a rich asshole spending their money traveling the world to kill things for fun. Next to the library is the game room where the photos of Babe Ruth are hanging, where I played poker for the first time. And right across the hall from the game room is the door to 14. It's locked and there's a wreath hanging on it so I can't see if the numbers are still there, but that's the room where my father slept, where my grandfather slept, where I slept. That's the room where I lay in bed at age 14 reading the novel Star Trek Federation before lights out. That's the room where we'd wake up before sunrise to the buzz of an old plastic alarm clock that was so loud it nearly always scared the shit out of me. I walk back up the hallway, turn past another huge stone fireplace, and go upstairs. The hallway back to the cuckoo's nest is blocked by a large chest. It always is at these open houses. I've been back here half a dozen times in the 25 years since the state took over, and I've never been able to get to the cuckoo's nest. Sometimes I imagine that if I would just jump over that chest and run to the end of the hall, I'd find Pap in the cuckoo's nest, pulling on his boots at the side of his bed. I hear the sound of a train whistle, so I walk out onto the second floor balcony. Pap worked on the railroad for 30 years. Whenever one of his trains rode that stretch of track, he'd always make sure they blew the whistle as it passed by the clubhouse. Or at least that's what he said. He retired from the railroad when I was 12 years old, and he's been dead since 2004, so that's not him blowing the whistle on this train. I guess maybe he just told us that to give us something to smile about when he wasn't around. There are 24 guest rooms on the second floor of the clubhouse. The members would stay here. The rooms are mostly identical to each other, except for the rooms at the end of the hallway, which are bigger and have their own private bathrooms. My brother and I spent Christmas here one year with my Aunt Becky, Mom's sister, and Uncle Eddie, and their son, my cousin Jason, who was a few years older than me. I was my parents' firstborn child, so Jason was the closest thing I ever had to an older brother. Aunt Becky and Eddie stayed in one of the rooms at the end of the hallway. Jason, my brother, and I stayed in the room across the hall. The framed pictures of hunting dogs are still hanging on the walls. I spend maybe half an hour wandering around the clubhouse, looking at things I remember and things I don't. It's the same as it always was in some ways, and in other ways it isn't. It can't be. In 95, when it was sold to the state, my family mourned it like a dead relative. It was a loss to us not to be able to come here whenever it suited us, not to be welcome always as part of the family. Now I see things differently. Now I'm glad this house and these thousands of acres belong to the state. I'd rather they be owned by the people than by a handful of aristocrats. But there will always be a part of me that longs for the way it used to be. Not because I wish the club was still theirs, but because I miss being able to pretend that it was mine.